Hi, welcome to a reading of An Elusive Love, a McNaughton Castle Romance, book two by Aubrey Wynn, presented by Itsy Bitsy Book Bits. Prologue, A Last in Love, Late Summer, 1810, McNaughton Castle. What do you mean she can't be my best friend? shouted Brody McNaughton from the clifftop. I thought you were fond of Christine. His eyes focused on the kaleidoscope of color below as a waterfall tumbled into the clear blue loke. McNaughton Blue, others had nicknamed the shade, after the clan's dominant eye color. The late afternoon sun peeked out from behind a cloud that created a rainbow from the cascade of sparkling drops. She's a lass, ye idiot. His older brother Ian climbed up the rock and slapped him lightly on the side of the head. Then why do ye claim that Lissy is yours? He clenched his fist, tired of arguing with his smug brother. It wasn't in his nature to be on the offensive, but this point rankled him for some unknown reason. Because we're betrothed by our clans and bonded by our souls, Ian explained in a slow, patient manner that made Brody want to thump him. She's different, ye kin. She'll be my wife some day. Do you plan on marrying Christine? Brody's jaw clamped tight. The rare tick of frustration surprised him. For the love of saints, I'm no thinking of marriage at all. You'll be ten and four soon, and your eyes are already rove over the lasses. I saw you spy the bonny redhead when we were in Glasgow, Ian chortled, a smug laugh that poked at Brody's anger again. What does that have to do with Christy being my best friend? There will come a time when you have to decide on a wife. You can be betrothed to one and keep the other as your confidant. Ian began to climb down the side of the hill. Are you coming or no? Aye, he said, as he followed his brothers sideways down the hill grabbing an occasional boulder or brush to keep his balance. You say a wife will not appreciate my friendship with Christine. Now you're catching on, you dunderhead, agreed Ian. He jumped the last few feet and pulled off his shirt, shoes, stockings, and finally his kilt. Laying them all on the boulder, he climbed on top of it and pumped his fist in the air. It's a broad day for a swim. Brody laughed as Ian yelled a McNaughton war cry and jumped into the look his bare buttocks, pale against the sun. Well, a woman who cannot accept Kirsty will never meet me at the church door, he copied Ian, but just as he was about to jump, he paused and peered over his shoulder. With a smile, he winked at the copse of trees. Frog alien, Brody shouted to the echoing pines as he joined his brother in the cool water. Christine watched from their secret place in the woods. The pungent odor of pine, decayed wood, and leaves filled her nostrils as she brushed bits of dirt from her damp skirt. She'd been collecting herbs for her mother and heard the boys' conversation. She hadn't meant to eavesdrop, had intended to join them, in fact, until she heard her name. Instead, she crept to the place where they always met, Brody's meditating spot. There was a plaid tucked in the branch above her, wrapped in oilskin. They often sat on it, eating a cold pasty, while Christine listened to Brody's latest woes or comical stories. Now, now she listened to him argue with his older brother. Ian was both right and wrong. They were the best of friends. Aye, and so much more, her heart whispered. Someday the big oaf would say it. She swiped a tear, then smiled. Brody sensed her as he always did. He looked in her direction his young, stocky body already muscular from physical labor and, his, and hard play, his firm white cheeks bare and flexing, and winked, winking, winked at her. Her breath caught before a giggle bubbled up her throat. She watched his wet black hair catch the sunlight, streaks of blue rippling through the thick locks as he came to the surface and pushed it back from his face with both hands. She sighed. Her body was changing, and with it, her feelings for Brody grew stronger. Emotions wreaked havoc on her mind, especially during her menses. When he touched her, leaned over her, or gave her a wink, her stomach tumbled. Her heart raced when he looked over her shoulder. His breath warmed on her ear. Ma called it a sure sign she was smitten. 
Kirsten knew better. There was no infatuation. At the age of 13, she was undeniably in love with Brody, but he was in love with life and everyone in it, a favorite within his family and the neighboring, neighboring clans. She realized she'd always have to share when it came to Brody, his affections, his time. That was one of the things she loved about him, his exuberance, for his excitement, his ability to pull her along on his grand adventures. He had a new pet in the stable every spring, could never decide on a pup from his grandfather's deerhound litters and always changed his mind about his favorite food. He's as fickle as the highland weather, her mother had warned. He'll break a score of hearts before he learned the pain himself. Kirsten didn't see him as inconstant, but rather so full of energy and affection that his mind never quit whirling. He hated to sit and be idle. He was loyal to the clan, to her, and to his own principles. If Brody made a promise, he kept it. How could that be fickle? Besides, his whims always passed, and then he came back to her. It was Kirsten who, who it was Kirsten he sought when he needed to work something through, a rant about his brothers or sisters or wonder about the ways of the world. It was Kirsten who comforted him <clears throat> when the rare disappointment dulled his enthusiasm. She was his constant, the shoulder he leaned on. Patience would be the key to his love. He would come to her eventually, as a man comes to a woman, and she would be waiting. For life without Brody McNaughton was unthinkable. Chapter 1 a twist in the road. Late April, 1819, Scottish Highlands. Scratching at his chest, Brody poked his face under his plaid and inhaled. His nose wrinkled. He needed a bath. Desperately, he reported to his grandfather, the McNaughton, then find Kirsten. He had a conversation with his oldest brother, Lachlan, about the future clan chief. They had a plan and he needed, to think, he needed to think it through aloud with Christy. As he emerged from the copse of trees, a movement to his right caught his eye. A long slope of spring grass gave way to another path that led to the village of Dundrave. He pulled up his horse and leaned over its neck to get a better look below. A flash of red and blue jumped to his vision, disappeared, followed by a screech and a clip-clop of horse hooves. Brody nudged the gelding sides with his heels and guided it down the hill. He came across a basket, partially filled with plants, and then a wool shawl and the McDunn tartan. At the bottom, in a shallow gully, lay a tangle of skirts and plaid and a cursing girl. A dapple gray pony stood on the other side of the path, sedately munching on grass. Well, what do we have here, Brody grinned. Are ye in need of some help, my bon lassie? My bonnie lass, or just in need a wee rest. Kirsten pushed up on her elbows, kicked at her skirts, and righted her plaid, somewhat. She blew the deep red locks from her eyes and squinted up at him. Look who has come home, my brawny Brody to the rescue. She smiled, dark eyes lit with pleasure as she held out a hand. He slid from the saddle, then grasped her fingers and pulled her to her feet. A pony doesn't like ye. He's young and still a wee green. A hair dashed out in front of him, and he spooked. She brushed off her backside, then stood on tiptoe to kiss his cheek. I was daydreaming instead of paying attention. On your way home, then? He nodded and bent to help her collect the herbs that had spilled from her basket. Kirsten's mother was the clan's healer and sent her daughter out regular, regularly to replenish medicinal supplies. Were you, what were you ye dreaming about? He retrieved the shawl that had been draped over her hair. None of your business, she replied with a smirk, then picked up her skirt and ran when he raised a bushy black brow. Brody caught her easily by the waist and tickled her belly as she doubled over and squealed in mock protest. She wriggled against him, and the movement startled him with a familiar pounding when a familiar pounding began low in his belly often a result of close contact with other women, never Kirsty. His muscles grew taut as his brain comprehended his body's reaction to his best friend. When her elbow drove into his gut, his breath came out in an oomph, and he let go. They faced one another, hands on their knees, and he blinked at the warmth that rushed through him. A smile curved her pink lips. 
His eyes traveled from her mouth to her neckline, her breast rising and falling as she took in a deep gulps of air. He swallowed. Something odd stirred inside Brody as he failed, as he tried to fathom what had changed. Her eyes still reminded him of a dark cup of coffee. Her thick cherry waves fell across her shoulders. Threads of deep red, tipped with gold, glistened and shimmered as her body dragged in another breath. He reached out and slid a, strand, a silky strand between his fingers. Her plump lips were parted, and he bent forward to kiss. Kristen froze, her eyes wide. He dropped a lock of hair. Their gaze is locked. For the love of saints, he whispered, when did ye become so lovely? When the pony let out a whinny, she ducked her head and ran under his arm to collect the horse. Brody followed behind on, with her blanket. Out of habit, he cupped his hands and squatted slightly to give her a leg onto the pony. A glimpse of her th slender ankle and firm stocking calf sent a rush of heat through him. I need to talk to you later. His hand rested behind her on the blanket. His fingers absently brushed the small of her back. Lachlan and I made up the thistle, made up, made, made up at the thistle inn and had a conversation about the future. She laid the blanket on the crook of her arm and chuckled to the horse. You can, you can, where to find me? I'll be waiting as always, she called over her shoulder. Brody watched her right away. What the devil just happened? He'd been gone less than two months, and suddenly his fiddle, his fiddle had decided Kirsty was an attractive female. Of course she was, but he scowled at her retreating figure. He hadn't eaten much. Maybe he was just lightheaded. Aye, that sounds it. I need sustenance, he declared to his horse as he mounted. Without another thought of the incident, he sent the gelding into an easy canter. He paused at the bottom of the lane and let, us, let out a satisfied sigh. Home, the aging castle with its ancient round tower and square addition had belonged to the McNaughton's for centuries. The drafty medieval structure would continue to be the seat of their clan for generations to come if his grandfather, Callum, had anything to say about it. And the man always had something to say. A Scottish deerhound loped up from the stable. With a howl, it announced Brody's arrival. His grandparents emerged from the castle. Callum, in his tr traditional belted plaid, squinted down on him, and Peggy wrapped in a shawl, waving enthusiastically. Black Angus's long, shaggy tail wagged a welcome as he took his place next to his master on the cobblestone. Callum dropped a hand to scratch the wiry, dark gray coat. I didn't expect you to see us until next week, his grandfather's broad chest expanded as he yelled. I hope it's not bad news. Brody shook his head. A young stable lad with curly hair ran up, and take, ran up to take his horse. You'll be pleased, Grandad. Dismounting, he tossed the rein to the boy and ambled to his grandmother for a hug. Miss me? Peggy nodded and poked at the faded red curls that had escaped, that had escaped her kerch. Like I missed, like I'd missed fresh butter on a warm biscuit. Her green eyes slanted as she looked, took him in. You need a good meal. You've lost weight. Callum laughed. The lad's been home but a minute, and you want to feed him already. It's better than whiskey on an empty belly. She wagged her finger at the giant, at her giant of a husband. No drinking until he's eaten something. It's barely afternoon, and I'd wager he'd missed breakfast. Brody gave her a loud kiss on the cheek and turned to his grandfather, arms held out, wiggling his brow, his brows. Granda, didn't even con don't didn't even consider it, lad. But he wrapped his arms around Brody anyway, and thumped him on the back. He was considered a younger, shorter version of his grandfather. Now Brody noticed a bit more gray in the older man's black hair, a few more creases on his face and neck, but those deep blue eyes never faded. In fact, they studied him keenly. We'll talk while you while you feed your belly, and then we'll have a wee swallow and welcome you home properly. The three cement entered the castle, and the aroma of dried sage and fresh bread tickled his nose. His stomach rumbled again. To the right was a huge receiving room, still retaining the same ambiance it had before the risings. The stone walls were covered in tapestries and banners of the McNaughton's and those clans who pledged fealty to them. 
A huge fireplace took up half of one wall and large carpets scattered the floor. The stories held above held the dining room and great hall for entertaining. To the left was the tower. It held the family's private quarters. They climbed the narrow, dim stairway and entered the smaller family dining area. Here, the decor changed to quiet elegance and comfort. The walls were polished, panels of light oak, and a long walnut table with intricately carved chairs took up the center of the room. Over the stone and marble hearth, his great-grandfather and faithful deer hound glowered at them from a heavy gilded, flame, gilded frame. Bro Brody had hated that portrait as a boy, those sapphire blue eyes seemed to follow him around the room. Cheese and breads were already set out. Callum poured them both some ale and pushed the plate of cold meat toward his grandson. The cheese is especially good, he commented, as Brody scooped butter onto a scone. I'll try that next, he said with a mouthful. I've only had a couple of stale oat cakes since early this morning. He took a pull of the ale and smacked his lips. Where's Ma? With your sister and an injured sheep. Bridget saw it, limp, saw it limping and insisted the leg needed to be wrapped, his grandmother informed him. Informed him. Your brother Lachlan is gone, so Glynn has said she'd assist. That lass does, does love her beasties. If it's, if it's no, not a sheep, a calf or a foal, or some wild creature, Brody shook his head, they bring out her gentler side. If she showed half as much compassion to her suitors... Don't start, Callum, said Peggy. She's young and in no hurry. Leave her be. Well, I see nothing has changed in my absence, Brody chuckled. Granddad's right, though. She'll never attract a husband when she has to prove she can outride or outhunt the poor man. Exactly my point, agreed Callum. A man wants a woman who's soft and pliant, not trying to beat him in an arm wrestling match. Is that what you call me when we met? Soft and pliant? asked Peggy, her tone deceivingly light. Oaked woman, you will not lead me into that trap. Callum bent over and placed a noisy kiss on his wife's mouth. You stole my heart from the first. It didn't matter if you were pliant, only willing. She smacked his chest but gave him a pleased smile before she turned back to her grandson. The bonfire for Beltant will be held in Dunderave. You've arrived just in time. Brody rubbed his hands together. Good food, whiskey, and lassies in their best gowns wanting to dance. The Edinburgh girls were bonny enough, but his heart belonged to the Highland pretties. The first of May was always a brawn celebration. You'll have, you'll behave yourself, lad, warned Callum. You're two and 20 and need to look for a wife. No sample in the brew. He rolled his eyes, but said nothing, not in the mood for another lecture. I saw Kirsten down by Dunderave path. Her pony had thrown her. No, is she all right? Shall I go by and check on her? Asked Peggy. His family had always liked Kirsty. His head, he shook his head but glanced at his grandfather, who now had a familiar glint in his eyes. Only her pride wounded. Now there's a fine lass, if you want my opinion, Callum said. Comes from a good family. Her dad works hard tending to cattle and sheep, and her ma is a healer. Brody snorted. She sound, sounds like a list of wifely qualities. We're close, but no in that way. I've had this conversation with Ma. He popped a slice of meat into his mouth and chewed in silence. His mind strayed to the earlier encounter with Kirsty and his body's reaction to her. A natural consequence from such close contact. He'd have to be careful of that in the future. They weren't children any longer, and his Ma had often reminded him. I saw Lachlan at the, th at the thistle on his way to Glasgow. Brody hoped to turn the conversation. Aye, your brother needed a wit respite from Ross Craig and the bickering. His temper gets the best of him. Lachlan would rather give him a scalping than a lecture, he agreed. Craig's a bl blethering idiot who beats his women but avoids his mon's fist. Aye, and I wouldn't trust him if he swore in his mother's grave. Callum scratched his jaw. But now I have two grandsons gone. By the way, Lachlan and I discussed the mill and may have found a solution to our problem. The McNaughtons were partners in a textile mill in Glasgow. Brody's aunt had, aunt had married a wealthy Englishman who's financed the venture but left the daily operations to his in-laws. It seems English earls could invest in trade but not dirty their hands with it. 
Callum had accepted his son-in-law's proposition and put the entire clan to work, either at the factory itself, providing the raw wool, or weaving special ordered tartans. Lord Stanfield refused to travel to the Highlands, but he agreed to bring his Scottish wife to Glasgow several times a year for a family visit and to discuss business. Once their son Gideon was born, the two families had taken an annual summer trip to the town so the McNaughton cousins would know their English kin. Since the old Earl's death, their cousin Gideon had assumed the earldom, and Ian had taken over the business trips for Callum. Ian's no been successful finding a replacement for the supervisor. He hadn't thought his absence would be extended like this, especially with a new wife. Brody busied himself with a piece of bread and another slice of meat, but kept a side eye on his grandfather. We hoped, perhaps, Ian would come, come home for a while. Let Lachlan stay in Glasgow. I can accompany you when needed for the chief's duties. Callum scowled, his thick brows pulled together. Peggy laid a hand on his arm. You will not be getting any grandchildren from a couple who are separated. <sighs> I suppose that's true enough. Well, it's settled then. Brody moved swiftly to the next subject. I'm happy to announce that we have signed a 30-year lease on the building along the water of Leith. By the next year, we'll have another mill in Edinburgh. And after 30 years, first option to buy or lease for another 30. Saints and sinners, Bellow Callum. Excellent work, lad. Excellent work. Time for the good scotch, he peeked at his wife, who rose with a sigh. I'll leave you both to your whiskey, she said as she moved toward the door. Don't overdo it. You'll be plenty of time to drink with your grandsons at the end of the week. Just as we swallow, Mochery, Callum said with a wink, just a wee swallow while we finish talking business.